morning, everyone. Um, William here, Eric from PWC. Can you hear me okay in the back? Yep, I tend not to use the microphone. Um, I'm based in London, and I work nationally uh, across our client base. So I work with private clients and public clients in all sectors. I also collaborate a lot with um, our colleagues in different countries. I've been with PwC for about two and a half years, um, and it's been a very interesting two and a half years because it's a very big change from where I worked before. I used to work for Symantec, which I'm sure you all know, um, and before Symantec I worked for IBM, and before that at and So I've got a strong technical background. But what's so interesting about where I work now at PwC is that we really look at all the problems from a pure business point of view, and hopefully that will come out a little bit in the presentation today, and hopefully you'll come away with some lessons that might help you in your own careers, in your own daily work. So first of all, the topic today is revolution or evolution. Um, this is an interesting piece of work that PwC in the United Kingdom was commissioned to do back in January. So we started this work in January. And it was commissioned by an organization called the Technology Strategy Board, which is part of the, the UK government. And the idea behind this was to look at information security, and it is information security, not IT security, up to 2020. Now that's a, that's a big crystal ball to look into, and it's quite a difficult task. And as we spoke to different people, and as we reached out across the globe to work with different organizations, the one theme that kept coming up time and time again was, is this anything new? Is this an evolution of what we're already doing? Or is there something that's really going to revolution the way information security works and protects us in the next 10 years? Um, and hopefully that will come out in the presentation today. One thing I would like to say though is, if you have any questions, it's a fairly small group, please feel free to raise your hand or stop me. It's good to have a little bit of interaction, okay? So first of all, just to go into a little more detail, um, what this document, and this is available on the internet, um, so if you do a search on PwC, Revolution, Revolution, you'll find it. It's about 50 odd pages, so what I've tried to do today is just take an extract. But what we said, set out to do, um, in accordance with our remit from the Technology Strategy Board, was really to build a roadmap for both business leaders and security professionals. And that's why I think this is different, because a lot of the time when we talk about security, with all due respect, we think about it primarily from a technical point of view. And if there's one thing that I've learned since I've been in PwC, it's about the bigger picture. It's about the people aspects. It's about the governance aspects. It's about what really, really concerns business people when you speak to them about information security. And hopefully we'll be able to extract that from the presentation as we go through it. So the report sets out potential and future scenarios around information security. And obviously it's broader, as I've just said, than just cyber crime or the technical aspects, even though there's a strong, strong technical focus in this. Um, and the other thing that's obviously really important is, and I'm sure that's quite clear to this audience, is as the volume of information grows, information security is really becoming intertwined with everything that is related to data and the internet. Now that may seem obvious to you, but it's not obvious to a lot of business people or people who are running projects, and you've probably seen yourself, you've been called in to give advice or provide support once a project has already been started. I mean, does that happen? Have you seen that? Uh, we need some security or we need to get advice from the security team. Too often security is bolted on after a project has been launched or after a decision has been made. And that has to change. Um, I really think that has to change to provide good security. It needs to be dealt with from the beginning. Interesting piece of research that you may have seen was done way back in the year 2000. So it's quite interesting. So it was done in 2000. We did this in 2010 and we're looking up to 2020. And it was done by a professor in South Africa who you might have heard of called Bong Song. And in 2000 he talked about the three ways of security. Uh, the paper has since been updated and it's now looking at the fifth wave of security. And in a nutshell, what he says and what his colleagues say in this paper, which I think is quite interesting, quite a brief paper, and it's easy to find on the internet, is that information security is the right term because it obviously includes technology, uh, processes, and people. But cybersecurity is probably the way of the future and a better term that we should be using now. And the reasoning behind this, and the 
thinking behind this is really pretty simple. It is around the fact that instead of looking inwards to protect the organizations and correct, protect things from a perimeter point of view, um, organizations really need to be thinking about an outward looking view and protecting every device and every interaction on the internet. So a little bit about where this information came from and who we spoke to. Um, we spoke to about 35 leading experts across the globe and we spoke to people as you can see in industry. So really, really good feedback from people like Barclays talking about the future of finance and some of the issues they were facing from cybercrime. Fascinating uh, input from the head of security at the BBC. Um, and if you try and think about some of the challenges and problems they had, I was amazed. Um, people's lives depend on protecting their sources, for example. Some of their employees are allowed to serve pornographic sites and child pornographic uh, sites for investigative purposes. Travel X really interesting insight once again about the future of finance and currency and, and how we will pay for things in the future. And honestly, people like Skype, uh, Voice of IP, but also people like National Grid, which is uh, a very interesting organization in the United Kingdom that gives lots of insight about smart grids. So lots of great feedback from the industry. Um, security vendors, um, you can see the names on the right hand side. The one that I would point out that's um, interesting is, is Garlic. Garlic's an interesting company in the UK that's been doing some great work around identity and protecting people's identity online. And we found their insight and their input useful. Obviously, um, we did touch uh, um, academia, we had great feedback from them. Um, and we also included the ISF. Not sure if you're aware of the ISF, just raise your hands if you know what the ISF is, Information Security Forum. Okay. The Information Security Forum uh, is a non-profit, membership-based organization that looks at information security. It's about 300 plus large organizations that are part of it, um, and they tend to look at things from a governance point of view, not so much from a technical point of view, but a lot of their thinking and documentation was, was used in this report. And then finally, um, on the right-hand side, the UK Office of Cybersecurity and a lot of input from the Ministry of Defence. So, pretty good balance between the different areas. So, as I said before, uh, the, the, the main question that we uh, looked at when we were dealing with this, is it an evolution or is it a revolution in terms of the next 10 years? And the traditional view of information security is really around risk mitigation. How do I reduce the potential risk? Um, and the return on security concept is still used in many situations to try and justify spending on security. Last night I was speaking with some of the other people who will be uh, talking today, and we were touching on this very subject, and we were talking about should we use FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, when we try and explain why a security solution would be good. And we've seen that used by some vendors, but at the same time, the, the return on security investment concept and approach is still used in many organizations, and they struggle with it. Um, they tend to struggle with it frankly, very significantly. But what we're seeing, if we look at things from a, a revolutionary point of view, is organizations really need to think about how information security can provide them with a competitive advantage. And we're starting to see this in some organizations already, primarily the finance sector, who I think we can learn a lot from. Early this year in the United Kingdom, a consumer magazine, which is called Which, published a list of the top UK banks that had made major investments in information security, and who, according to Which magazine, were protecting their consumers or their clients the best using information security investments. And so the banks are now starting to think, hey, how can I use this for competitive advantage? How can I market my investments in information security to show the, the others that I'm better than they are? And I think that's very interesting. I think it's very important because I think when business people start to understand the importance of what we do, it's going to make our jobs a lot easier. But at the same time, I think it demands from us, from the information security professionals, um, a little more understanding of some of the business requirements and business needs. So I think we're at a bit of a crossroads in terms of next steps. So I personally, you may want to read the report and make your own decision in terms of is it a revolution or is it a revolution. But I think over the next 10 years, we're going to see some significant changes that will change the way we do business. And I think it will be about security being built in, and I think it will be about security professionals being more aligned with business. Give me a question. Um, so in 50 years plus security and technology, what, what makes the next 10 years significant? Okay, well, which 
Should we go into the presentation? Yeah, I'm just going to get through your cardiac talk. No, it's, it's a very good question. A very good question. We published last week a survey that we do every year, and you've probably grown when they say a survey because you probably think, oh, it's another survey. There's a lot of surveys out there. But I do think this one's slightly different. Last year we had 7,000 respondents from across the globe. This year we're up to 14,000. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. Because if the different if business leaders and security professionals are really taking the time to answer those questions, that means that something's changing. And I do think that um, business leaders are the people that are going to write for change. And just one brief example that might help answer your question before we go into a little more detail. I spend a lot of time with big multinationals looking at their information security functions and how they're set up. And I've done a couple of reviews with my colleagues over the last couple of months. And one thing that has come up time and time again, which I think is fascinating, is who should the security function, the CISO, the CSO report to? Traditionally, it's a CIO, and traditionally they don't have enough authority, but that's changing. And according to the organizations that I've been working with over the last couple of months, they've been saying, hey, let's have him report in, him or her report in to the CFO, or the CEO, or directly to the board. And I think that is really, really significant. So I'm not saying that's the tipping point, but I think that does show that things are starting to change. So a lot of the things that we're going to touch on now, you may say, hey, it's nothing new. But I think it's a combination of all these different trends together that will push things forward. Um, so there's still a lot of uncertainties, there's still a lot of things that need to be decided. But as I said before, um, businesses are going to need to innovate. There's going to be new requirements in terms of product skills and services. And one thing I would touch on that worries me greatly um, is skills. I'm trying to hire people right now, I'm really struggling. Uh, we hired in the last couple of months um, probably just over 20 people in one team down in London, but we're struggling to find the right amount of resources and the right type of resources with that capability to work both as business people and technical people so they can change hats. It's not easy. The IT, and this is IT specific, security market in the UK alone is estimated at four to five billion pounds. Probably put that in your eyes. But that's a big number um, and it's growing despite the crisis and despite the recession. So, if we think back to what I was saying before about the return on security investment approach for security, which people struggle with, um, the model down below, the total cost of information security, seems to resonate much better with people that I work with. So, we look at life cycle costs of deploying and operating security solutions, so obviously the basic things that most people take into account on the left hand side, but obviously, there's a great amount of risk to an organization's reputation. And if you think of what happened to TJ Maxx in the United States after they were hacked, and the continued press coverage, negative press coverage that they get, the impact on the brand and the impact on cost customer satisfaction is very hard to estimate, but is very significant. Another area that I've started to see a lot of interest from my clients is around intellectual property. Right now I'm working with a global chip company uh, that has operations in 16 countries. And they've said, we are extremely concerned about the protection of our intellectual property. We're going to go for either 27,001 certification because we need to report back to the board that we've been thinking about information security in those 12 domains in its broadest terms. And I think there, what really made change, so maybe once again the tipping point, is um, what happened to Google in China. And more importantly than Google in China, what I thought was fascinating was Intel. Because when Intel got hacked, they reported in their SEC 10K filing that their systems had been compromised and that their intellectual property was at risk. Going back to what I was saying before, that's very significant because when business leaders have to start putting that in an official SEC 10K filing, that means that the board of directors is going to look at it. That means that the shareholders are going to look at it. That means that the authorities are going to look at it. So it's being recognized as a problem that's more significant than just IT. And I'm convinced that that's going to help. We did uh, some work to look at annual reports. We've all seen annual reports. And they talk about risk to businesses. And we were quite surprised at the lack of coverage in annual reports published by big companies on information security. That has to change. Organizations put so much into uh, their IT systems, they have so much in intellectual property that needs protecting, they do need now to think about annual reports and covering that in their annual reports. Operating
operational effectiveness, um, you can think about DDoS attacks, you can think about you know, making sure that sites are available. Um, obviously, if, if sites aren't available and customers aren't able to connect, um, it's going to affect operational effectiveness. And then financial impacts of incidents. Um, there's some really great research out there in terms of the financial impact of a data breach. We saw what happened in the United Kingdom when HMRC lost to this massive, massive cost, an incredible amount of negative press. But I, one thing that organizations often don't take into account is the indirect costs, so the lack of um, oh, the defocusing executives from their daily job to begin to look at mitigating the problem itself. So those are the things that I believe tend to resonate well with business leaders when you look at information security in its broader sense. So, what, what did we touch on? Let's get into the heart of the matter. What are the seven things that the report really began to explore in more detail? They're listed on the right hand side. Infrastructure revolution, data explosion, always on, always connected world, future of finance, tougher regulations and standards, multiple internets, new identity and trust models. And it's been fascinating because as I said, we started this work in early January 2010 and already every single one of these areas has seen some pretty significant developments, which I'm sure you're all aware of, but we'll touch on a couple of those already. But um, what also is interesting is that, as I said before, um, most organizations um, are still overlooking the people aspect of information security. Um, I, I grew up in the technical world, in the, in the technical space, but what I've been enjoying so much in the last couple of years are both, maybe a little less if I have to confess, the process or the governance aspects of security, but the people aspects are absolutely fascinating. How many of you have gone through a security awareness training program? Just raise your hands. Okay, you probably don't need it, but uh, if you look at security awareness programs at many organizations, what do they do? They run a CPT once a year, and they say, okay, we've done our security awareness. I would challenge that, and I would say that CBT is not going to solve the problem in terms of security awareness. A presentation when people join an organization is not going to solve the problem, but people need to understand some of the basics. And I think that security awareness is something that has been overlooked and needs more um, focus from organizations. It's about people, processes, and technology. But what was really interesting in the findings is the second bullet point. So obviously what I've just said is now, is today. But we believe that by 2020, there's actually going to be a very, very strong reversion back to technology and technical controls. So while, yes, today it is about getting the balance right between those three things that I've mentioned, in 2020, it's going to be so complex, there's going to be so much data, the speed of processing is going to be so fast, and the emergence of more complex and, 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 and automated threats are going to create so many issues for security functions that probably one of the most significant investments organizations should and can make to mitigate the risk is really technology. So we believe that there will be a complete reversion back to technology, which I think is interesting. So infrastructure, let's look at these in a little more detail. Infrastructure revolution. So obviously um, substantial increase in the penetration rate of high-speed broadband and wireless networks. Um, interesting to listen to people last night talking about some of their issues with mobile, some of their issues with Wi-Fi. We're still not there yet. Um, still a lot more needs to be done in terms of connectivity. Um, centralization of computing resources and widespread adoption of cloud computing. Now you may think that's a lot of hype and the whole cloud model software as a service model is still getting a lot of discussion and a lot of debate in different areas. But what I find interesting to note about the cloud are a couple of things. Um, Gartner said that in July of 2009, the cloud Have you all seen Gartner's type curves? Raise your hands if you've seen Gartner's type curves. If you haven't, you may want to look at it. It's, um, it's quite interesting just to do a Google search on Gartner height <laughs> curves. And um, what I've seen in the UK at least over the last couple of months, partly due to the recession, is that organizations are adopting the cloud and they're adopting it quite aggressively. And part of that is because of the cost savings and the flexibility and obviously the technical benefits. But what has actually stunned me is the lack of focus on the information security aspects, the lack of understanding, and actually the problems that have already occurred in the cloud have been quite significant. I haven't had a lot of press coverage yet, but I've had a couple of clients who've actually suffered breaches in the cloud, and I can tell you that from a forensics point of view, that prevents some 
really significant challenges in trying to understand what happened and where it happened, because obviously it's a virtual environment and very difficult to understand. But the cloud is going to happen, and when you start to see you know, an article on the front page of The Economist about the cloud, I tend to think that that means it has hit mainstream. Um, what's also interesting about the cloud, I think, is that it's actually taking power away from IT. There's an interesting story that a gentleman who used to be a CISO at a large pharmaceutical company told, um, and I will repeat it, which was one of the scientists needed to crunch a large set of data, clinical data. And he wasn't happy with the time or the responses he was getting from his IT group. So what did he do? He took out his corporate credit card, went on to Amazon, and bought, his, and bought the services that he needed. Crunched the data in record time, and thought he had done the right thing. Now, have you or haven't you done the right thing? His data was, was processed according to what he needed to do. He got a great job. And he obviously hadn't thought about the security or the data privacy aspects. But if you think about that in a little more detail, it really does begin to take away some of the power from IP. Um, proliferation of IP connected devices, we're all seeing, starting to see some finally, finally starting to see a lot more interest in uptake in IP6, which is quite interesting because it's been talked about for many years, but just over the last couple of months, more and more of the big suppliers are being increased requests coming in from their clients for IP6 information. And the second last point I think is really interesting. I've got a lot of customers who are already starting to say we want to explore this. The blurring of the work personal life divide. Now, some of, for some of us, maybe it's already blurred, but bring your own approach to IT. When you start to combine that with something like the cloud, things are going to change. So I have a client that said to me, William, why should I be buying Blackberries for my employees when most of my employees already have smartphones, iPhones, iPads? Why can't we use those? Um, and the answer is absolutely, absolutely, why not? But let's look at it from a security point of view and try and understand what are some of the new challenges and risks that you will face if you do that. So, I mean, just think about it. You know, if I had my own personal iPhone and I was using that in PwC and I was to serve some site that wasn't in compliance with PwC's you know, acceptable internet usage policy, or let's say my partner or my friend took my phone and did something with it, what sort of liabilities could I create for the organization I work for? PwC happens to be financial service authority regulated because um, of the work that we do. And because of that, there's specific requirements and specific things that we have to do with our devices and our data. When organizations begin to allow what I often call consumerization or bring your own device, and you combine that with the cloud, the reliance on the traditional IT system is going to be less and less than it was in the past. Finally, I think the evolution of user, inter in user interfaces is going to be another uh, big one. Um, possibly you can link that in with uh, augmented reality, that the powerful interfaces that are going to come out and allow us to interact differently with computers are going to uh, change things significantly as well from a security point of view. Data explosion, um, massive increase in the quantity of data. Um, but not only data at rest, that's obviously data in databases, but also data in transit is, is growing extremely rapidly. Um, and there's going to be more sharing of sensitive data um, between organizations and between individuals. More visual data, more geolocation data, and obviously more people connected globally. I, a good example here is the smart grids. Um, a lot of organizations and a lot of countries are looking at smart grids, and obviously it's going to allow a lot of benefits that is going to allow for cost savings, savings of electricity. The green agenda is rising that significantly. But if you think about it from a security point of view and the risks from smart grids, they are quite significant. Um, think about if I was able to get onto your smart meter and understand when you were at home and collate that with other data that's available, maybe in Facebook or other systems, I can start to build a very clear picture about who you are as an individual. Um, other concerns are the data breaches. We continue to see data breaches. Um, in the UK, there's almost a weekly occurrence, a weekly coverage of some large-scale data breach. And we're seeing increased um, focus from the regulators. So, for example, in August of this year, a large insurance company in the United Kingdom was fined £2.2 million pounds because they lost some backup tapes and they were unencrypted. So more and more focus on the regulators and more pressure on this specific problem. The other area that 
uh, we're starting to see that it's obviously going to create more of a challenge from a security point of view. It's always on always connected. Um, greater people, uh, greater connectivity being driven by social networking platforms. Um, fascinating area um, and fascinating developments to watch. A lot of organizations that I work with have actually said, we're not going to allow Facebook, for example. We're going to shut it down. They block it. And they feel as if they've done the right thing. Um, other organizations have started to say, hey, what are the business benefits from leveraging social networking? How can I use this to attract younger people into my organization? And what sort of um, alternative uh, business models and working models can I use and, and adopt thanks to social networking platforms? PwC, for example, we have communities in some of the universities in Facebook, and we use that to help graduates understand what it may like to be in P work in PwC. And we use it in, in the firm to help communicate with different people when they're on some continents or when they move from country to country. So I think that social networking um, is going to really drive some fascinating changes, but at the same time, fascinating and, and complex new challenges from an information security point of view as well. The other one that I wanted to touch on was critical national infrastructure. Um, I do a lot of work in the United Kingdom with the CPNI, which is the Center for Protection of National Infrastructure. And in most countries, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there is a CNI, or Critical National Infrastructure Organization. And they look at the, uh, or the organizations that provide critical national infrastructure services um, to a country. And those may be things like airport, banking, telecommunications, pharmaceutical. But the challenges that we're starting to see here around critical national infrastructure is with increased connectivity of those different networks and also more use of, of off-the-shelf hardware. Instead of using proprietary hardware and proprietary software, using more off-the-shelf hardware and software, obviously the level of risk is going to increase greatly. Future finance. Uh, an area that I'm fascinated by and I think that we're really at the beginning. I like the quote on the right hand side. I thought that was quite interesting and quite revealing. There's a demand for anonymous electronic payments. There's no current equivalent to cash and even the new contactless payment cards leave uh, paper trail. And I do think that's an interesting one to think about because we're not there yet. There's been a lot of experiments and a lot of trials around mobile, mobile finance and mobile payments, but a lot more needs to be done. Um, I've been working with a couple of banks um, at looking at the future of finance and exploring this with them. Um, and there are some significant challenges. Some of the more interesting areas to look at are some of the third world countries. Some of the third world countries down in Africa have been doing some absolutely amazing things with mobile payments. But the concern here is if you think about it from a formal point of view, a legal point of view, or a regulatory point of view, is who holds the keys and who, who, who becomes the owner of and the regulator, if you will, of that if I'm doing all my mobile payments on my, my phone? What involvement does the bank have and what sort of authority does the bank have when I'm doing mobile um, payments on my phone? So I think the future finance is going to is also going to create some fantastic and interesting challenges for us. So for regulation and standards, um, obviously the, the international crisis and the, uh, the, the downturn created a lot of uh, demand in the industry for new regulations and new standards. Um, they are struggling to keep up with I work closely with some of the different regulators in the UK and without naming any of them, I have to admit I've been very surprised at the lack of understanding of some of the basic concepts of things like cloud computing or phishing and farming. They really, really need to spend some time to understand, I think, some of the new trends and developments that are happening to be able to apply correct regulations and standards. But there's obviously a concern with regards to privacy, um, and there's obviously a concern around net neutrality. But once again, just in the UK, um, the Information Commissioner's Office, um, as of this year, now has the possibility to fine up to £500,000 if the Data Protection Act in the United Kingdom is breached, which is significant. He also has the right to come in and audit organisations, uh, whether it's government organisations, to make sure they're compliant with the EPA. And as I mentioned before, the FSA and the Services Authority have been levying very significant fines. £2.2 million pounds in August against an insurance company. I believe it was 2.7 earlier this year against another bank um, with regards to the lack of clean desk policy. 
Filing cabinets were locked, and the security policies weren't easily accessible on the internet. And I think that's interesting just to think about because I know a lot of you have a very deep technical focus, but it is interesting to think about that governments are starting to find organizations because they're not looking at some of those more straightforward challenges. So while, yes, technology can help, sometimes some of the most simple and basic things are still not being adhered to. I mean, locking workstations, piggybacking, security badges, clean desk policy, and locking filing cabinets. So tougher regulations and standards, I am convinced is an area that's going to drive more spending and more innovation with regards to information security and needs. Multiple internet. Interesting one, and interesting because I remember when this specific topic came up in the research and in the discussion groups, there was a fair amount of pushback from people around us saying this is probably not going to be a major issue. But just over the last couple of weeks, last couple of months, there's been a lot of talk in the press about multiple internets and about the need for multiple internets. We've already started to see more and more censorship, and there's certain countries out there, obviously, such as Saudi Arabia and China, that have done a lot around censorship and firewalls. But a lot of organizations themselves, so large uh, companies, are actually saying, I need access to a more secure internet, and I'm willing to pay for it. And we know that Verizon, and we know that Google have been investigators, and we think that as we move forward, the possibility of having multiple internets will, one, offer a lot of business advantages to large businesses who are willing, who are willing to pay for it, but obviously are going to create um, some new and interesting requirements from, from a technical point of view. We're also probably going to see an increased um, uh, amount of closed social networks, so not networks that are open like Facebook or LinkedIn, but things that are much more closed down, and probably also more growth around paid content. And if you think about just the iPhone and, and the success of the apps and the, the closed, if you will, the closed garden approach, the walled garden approach, I do think that that is significant and I think that businesses will be looking at that type of approach now in the future. New identity and trust. This is probably one of the most complex ones that came up in the piece of research. Um, but it's clear that the effectiveness of current identity and concepts and approach is just not working. I was speaking with, this is a true story, the head of security at a large UK retail bank. You know what he told me? He said, William, I don't believe anymore in the authentication systems that we put in place. Two-factor authentication for me is not going to solve the problem. Where my focus is going now in terms of protecting people who do internet banking with the bank or not going to mention his name is around back end. And so instead of worrying, instead of focusing so much time and attention on the authentication, we're going to look at the transaction monitoring at the back end and we're going to monitor that, that extremely closely and look at that for potential fraud and use that to help inform us. But I think that the whole area of identity is one that's going to create massive areas of opportunity for security professionals. And it's going to require new models um, and new areas uh, of development to include devices and data. But I think that this is, this is probably the important point here. So it's a move away from the perimeter to an information-based security model. Um, and once again, interesting quote from uh, a gentleman looking at uh, biometrics, because even biometrics, which oftentimes are, are at our push or promoted as a silver bullet, obviously aren't going to be the, the, the final solution. So those, in a nutshell, were the seven major trends. Um, and yes, maybe you don't think there's any sort of evolution or revolution there, but when you start to combine them and you think about them all together, I do think that those are going to be some pretty significant drivers in the next 10 years that are going to affect us all. And so a, a couple of questions or, or trends um, about how that may affect us and how may, that may uh, change the way we work. And what we tried to do here, as you can see, is look at it through a different lens. So looking at it from a chief executive officer's point, leaders really need to think about how they can leverage information security, as we said before, um, as a competitive advantage. 
They also need to um, measure the risks related to information security alongside the other risks that they, they currently measure. And as I said before, I think it was fascinating what happened to Intel. I do think information security needs to be recognized by the board and covered in things such as annual reports. And I also think that all the metrics related to information security aren't leveraged properly by organizations right now. I mean, remember when I started to work with managed security services many, many years ago, one of the questions I always asked was, when was the last time you really looked at the logs and your firewalls and your intrusion detection systems? And still today, that was many, many years ago, still today the answer still seems to be not very frequent. Interesting to see that HP bought ArcSight just a couple of days ago, so obviously there is a trend there to use the log data more effectively, but I do think that um, this, from a chief executive officer point of view and a board level point of view, needs a little more focus. From a chief technology officer's perspective, I do think that the cloud combined with mobile working and consumerization, as we said before, are really, really going to challenge the way companies handle IT today. And that simple example I gave you from the pharmaceutical company of buying and acquiring services with a corporate credit card, I think is quite interesting because it really does challenge everything the IT function does today. And I think it will require the IT function to be much more aggressive and much more nimble. But at the same time, um, culture. Culture does need to be applied. Sure, we said that maybe by 2020 there will be a reversion back to technology, but I think until we get there, people can help a lot. And I do think that more work needs to be done around security awareness. And I do think that if people understand how their behavior can impact the organization, that's a good step to helping embed security culture in an organization. From a supplier point of view, research and development needs to be prioritized, and vendors need to think about, obviously, some of these security concerns. So this report itself has gone to the R&D community in the UK and has been used to help them understand where they should begin to focus their time and attention. Governance is about regulation, but it's also about getting the balance right. Um, one bullet point that isn't there that I think needs to be thought about, which I mentioned earlier, is the regulators are behind the curve. And they really, really struggle. And when you look at things from a legislation, or you look at things from a legal framework point of view, a lot of legal frameworks that are in place that are trying to protect our privacy, that are trying to protect our rights, are still not up to date and don't take into account things like the cloud, consumerization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Investors, um, obviously, there's going to be new and significant opportunities around InfoStack. Um, we need to think about that and when to invest. So those were the four or five different areas um, that we believe this research can be applied to. And then finally, um, you know, are you up for the challenge? Are we up for the challenge? I tend to think that, sure, there's a lot of uncertainty as how information security is going to evolve, and it's a big risk of all. And I don't necessarily pretend to have the answer. But it is certain that businesses are going to need to innovate and develop new products and services and skills. So we are going to require new skills. Um, and I think that there's going to be new business models that are going to add and, and provide competitive advantages both for financial investors, um, for both for finance and, and investors alike. And there's going to be increased growth. So I'm actually very positive about the future moving forward with regards to information security. But I do think the one concern I have uh, is around the gap that I mentioned before. And I do think there's a gap between information security professionals and business professionals. And I think that's something we need to think about and consider how we can close that gap. We're actually doing a piece of research right now with ISC Squared, which I'm sure you all know of. And with ISC Squared, we've done a piece of research. And what we've done with um, their CEO from Mayo, we've interviewed a series of different business leaders. And we've spoken to about 15 senior business leaders in the UK to ask them, what are the challenges you face when you engage with information security people? And where do you struggle? And where do you have issues? And what we're trying to do is we're trying to capture that in a piece of research that we'll be presenting at RSA in London in early October. Um, feel free to track me down if, if you're interested in a copy of that when it's published, because hopefully that will help us along the way, because as I said before, I think this is one of the greatest areas that I personally am concerned about. Um, the report's available um, on the InnovateUK.org website. Uh, I mentioned the PwC Global State of Information Security Survey, which is also available on the internet. Um, interesting document because, as I said before, it contains responses from 14,000 people. It's also a benchmarking tool, which is really interesting. Um, probably doesn't get enough um, airtime, 
But the benchmarking tool is quite powerful because I can say, okay, I'll take a certain organization through these 40 questions and then bench them automatically on the fly against the global data set. And many organizations have been saying to me, hey, that's exactly what I need. I need to understand where my security posture is, where I'm placing my investments, where I'm placing my resources. Let's do some benchmarking to try and get an understanding of where I am compared to my peers. And I believe that's a, a powerful way forward. And finally, the five ways of, of information security that I mentioned. Short document, but it, it makes for some good reading. And I'm pretty sure by 2020, it's probably going to be the tenth way of information security. And I've rushed through that pretty quickly. Um, I'm a little ahead of time. Any questions or comments? Yes? You mentioned once that uh, we should be seeing these things in annual reports. Mm -hmm. If you were the CEO of a big company, and you have dirty laundry. Yep. What possible incentive would you have to tell people unless somebody forced you to? It's a very good question. I wonder that. Well, it's a very good question. I'm going to try and answer that. Uh, PwC is, is an auditor. We're one of the big four. Okay. And obviously, I work now with different people than whom I used to work with when I worked for in Semantic. When I was working in Semantic, I tended to work with the IT people and security people. In PwC, I tend to work with the CFO, head of legal, or more importantly, the head of internal audit. And the head of internal audit has a responsibility to ask those really difficult questions. And they do need to help their business leaders stay on a straight and clear and transparent line. And when you work with the people in IA, and if you don't, if you haven't worked with the people in internal audit, you may want to keep that in the back of your mind, because it's interesting. They do have to answer those questions, and they do have a right to take that up to the board. And I do think, as I said before, Intel is a good example. Why did they report it to the SEC? Because they felt that they, your, your organization, your intellectual property was at risk, and they had a duty to report it to their shareholders. There are, as you know, there's different laws, primarily in the United States right now, that oblige organizations to report a loss of data or data breach. And we're seeing increased activity here also in, in, in Europe from the European Union and in certain countries in, the, in, in Europe to provide data breach notification laws. So I think it's a matter of time for the legal system also forces us to move forward. But I do think depending on who you're speaking to an organization, they will want to report it in the future. Uh, I agree with everything you said up to the point that they will. I think, you know, the, the internal audit, all the board needs to know this. Yep. Obviously, you can't go in your enterprise. Yep. But whether or not you disclose to the public, I think that's a much more complicated issue. And it seems to me that information security takes a pretty standard approach. You need to disclose, but from a business point of view, that can be terribly damaging. Yeah, I guess so. I don't think it's quite that easy. Okay. Interesting. There's a question here. Interesting. Uh, just to expand on that a little bit more. I was asked to present at a very interesting closed door meeting that six months ago in London, and they were non-executive directors. So they were all people who sat on the board of FTSE 100, so some of the UK's biggest companies. And with all due respect to those women and men, the the average age was probably over, the, over 70. Okay. The level of concern, what I'm saying, the level of concern with regards to information security was very high in that room. And I was amazed. We were talking about a white paper that we had published in July 2009 around espionage and some of the things we've touched on today. And they were asking some pretty simple questions, but difficult questions to answer, such as, I'm dealing with a large merger. I'm dealing with an acquisition. Should I use Gmail? And just the fact that they were beginning to recognize some of these risks, and I know I've answered this question in a roundabout way, but just the fact that they were beginning to think about some of these issues, I thought was quite a positive I think you're proving this point by saying that. No, 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 I mean, proving is right. Yeah. That, that you, you started that whole diatribe with, I had a closed door meeting. Yep. Yeah. Right? Why wouldn't they? They don't want it in public. They don't want to tell people. They don't want to be open and transparent and all of these things preach, right? They don't want that. They want to close their meeting. I mean, in the UK now, because of the Data Protection Act and the work from the Information Commissioner Office, the Commissioner's Office, we see a lot of reports almost on a weekly basis. Um, I agree with you, there's a culture that needs to change, and it does change, and it does, it does vary from industry to industry. Um, but I think something's happening. Um, I do think there's never seen an industry that is, right? I, I think that we see it more because of 
So, have, have you guys ever done a baseline analysis to, to proof growth? Proof growth of? Uh, in general, so let's, let's take the concept of security of all, however you want to put it, from policy, procedure, process, design, technology, whatever. Do, but no, we haven't done that. Because I, I, I tend to believe that there is a lot of growth. Mm -hmm. I think that we're closer to it, so we can see more of it. Yeah. Uh, but I think if we removed ourselves significantly, that we wouldn't find that there's a, a big revolution at all. It's, it's a mountain that's slowly moving. Uh, but I don't, I, I, I can't agree with that in 10 years, or 20 years, or 50 years. There's, there's really this giant, massive change. I think that, you know, when, when we look at everything up close, it looks like it's speeding and going very fast but from far away. It's you more know, of an evolution as opposed to Yeah, I think it would be really interesting to see how that proves against a, a, a much longer sample set of the Okay. Do you have another question? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on the, uh, the whole following thing, um, disclosing information. Essentially, they, they don't want to disclose it, but they have to. It's an SEC regulation report, anything that may impact a company's financial statements, you know, under authority concern. So, Intel, I'm sure, didn't want to report on that, but uh, because it could have a significant impact on going concern in the business, they have to. So I'm sure they're not sitting there being like, yeah, it's a good idea, it's a good thing to do to report that. They're being forced to report it under SEC regulation Sir. I think there's a bigger issue. I think it's, for me at least, I think the pendulum is swung a little too far. And don't get, get me wrong, I'm, I'm not a supportive corporation, but it's, it increases the cost for all of us, all these letters and notifications. And the question is, what's the benefit for us? You know, and it's just a question I don't begin to have the answer for.